Okay, so good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us again, Wednesday, 10th of March, 8 p.m. for the third BOMS Journal Club. And uh, we're delighted to have the Bristol team led by Dimitri uh, and members of his MDT uh, run a journal club for us this evening. Before we, uh, before we move on to that, I just want to forewarn you of two dates uh, for your diaries. The next and the second uh, BOMS free educational webinar will be held on Wednesday the 24th of March and we're really delighted to have Dr Scott Shikora uh, give us a talk about weight regain and whether it's inevitable following bariatric surgery. So Dr Shikora, as you know, will be the incoming president of IFSO and we're really delighted that he's agreed to um, give us this session. So that's the 24th of March, uh, followed then on the 14th of April by the next instalment of the Journal Club, and that will be uh, by the team in UCL. So we look forward to their meeting. Uh, tonight we have Dimitri. So I'd like to ask Dimitri to uh, come on and lead the Journal Club tonight. And once again, we're going to have two papers, an IHP paper and then a surgical paper. And we have 20 minutes for presentation and discussions. And we'll hope to close the meeting at quarter to nine as usual. So thank you, Dimitri. Thank you, Sarif. Uh, good evening, um, everyone, and welcome to the North Bristol Journal Club. Our first speaker is Karen Coleman, a bariatric dietitian who works in our multidisciplinary team. Karen is also a clinical lecturer in dietetics in the University of Bristol and has done a lot of work with Jane Blaisby um, in core outcome sets, but also in the Bioband Sleep Study, the uh, world's largest randomized clinical trial in bariatric surgery. Karen will be presenting a qualitative paper. Karen, the floor is yours. Thanks, Dimitri. Um, can I just check that, that my screen is sharing okay? Yes, all good. <laughs> good, okay. So I don't need to introduce myself because Dimitri has done that very nicely, thank you. Um, so the paper that I'm going to discuss today was published not too long ago in 2020 in Clinical Obesity, which is an international journal and an official journal of the World Obesity Federation. It's still quite a new journal and as such it doesn't yet have an impact factor but there are a lot of great papers coming out of this journal and I anticipate that we'll see a really good impact factor in the coming years. The reason I chose this paper is because I'm really passionate about long-term follow-up care after bariatric surgery and any interventions for obesity. I think that good follow-up care is critical to helping people manage the challenges which there will inevitably be and also to maintain positive changes not only to weight but to quality of life. And although this paper is not specifically focused on people who have undergone bariatric surgery, I think the insights that we can draw from it are also applicable to bariatric surgery patients. This study was led by the MRC Epidemiology Unit in Cambridge, which is a world-class unit that does fantastic public health research. Also in collaboration with the Primary Care Research Unit in Cambridge, the University of Leeds and with Carly Hughes, who many of you will know from the Fakenham uh, Tier 3 Weight Management Service. One of the co-authors is a patient representative and there was good patient involvement in the design and analysis of this study. Um, this is always a good thing to see and makes you think that the investigators really put time into doing things in a quality way that is relevant for patients. So this was a qualitative study um, looking at the strategies used by people to maintain weight loss five years after receiving a behavioral weight management intervention that was delivered as part of a large trial. And just to give you a bit of background on the trial, it was called the RAP study and the main two-year trial results were published in the Lancet. There was over a thousand participants. So it was a three-arm trial in primary care which compared behavioral weight loss program which was Weight Watchers either at for 12 weeks or 52 weeks of Weight Watchers, and also compared with a brief intervention, which was essentially a self-help leaflet for patients. The average baseline BMI of patients who took part was 34.5. And perhaps not surprisingly, they found that the 52-week intervention was more effective in terms of weight loss, 
and this was still statistically significant at two years. So that's the background for this. The aim of this qualitative study was to compare the strategies used by people who had either maintained or regained weight five years after participating in the Weight Watchers intervention and to identify strategies associated with better long-term weight maintenance. Um, and because it was conducted with trial participants, they had objectively measured weight, five-year weight data from the trial, which they could present alongside their qualitative findings. Whereas a lot of qualitative research in this area is standalone and it relies on patient self-reported weight. So the combination of these methods makes for a stronger paper. So before we go any further, you might be asking what is qualitative research? And while we don't have time for a detailed discussion today, to put it quite simply, it seeks to answer the what and the why questions instead of the how big or how many that quantitative research seeks to ask. So it allows for a deeper, deeper level of understanding about a topic than you could achieve with qu quantitative methods only. So an example might be, um, wanting to know referral rates for bariatric surgery. This is a quantitative numbers-based data. But you then might also want to know why are referral rates so low? And qualitative methods would be a good approach to answer this type of question. So there were 26 participants who were recruited from the Cambridge and Liverpool centres of the trial. And they use something called purposive sampling to identify people to invite to the, to the qualitative study. And this is a very typical type of sampling used in qualitative research. It involves deliberately selecting participants based on their characteristics in order to adequately address your research question. Um, and so they purposely sampled people from the trial based on weight trajectory and demographic characteristics, aiming to achieve a diverse sample. So this type of sampling is very different to the statistical sampling that you would use in, qu in quantitative research. In quantitative research, you're aiming to create a statistically representative sample so that you can generalize to the larger population. Um, and qualitative research does not typically aim to generalize statistically to a larger population, although some people argue that qualitative research can be used to generalize to theoretically similar situations. So you might be thinking, well, they only had 26 participants, what can we really say from this study? This is a very typical sample size for a qualitative study because data collection and analysis are extremely labor intensive. Um, qualitative interview studies typically wouldn't include any more than maximum of 50 participants. Um, studies larger than this just are not feasible to undertake and analyze in a high quality manner. So out of the 26, 10 of these people were classed as weight maintainers and how they defined that was um, up to three kilograms or less of weight regain at five years after the intervention. And 16 were classed as weight regainers, which was people who had regained more than three kilograms of weight at five years. There was no justification for how they defined or chose these limits. Um, they, there was a mean age of 60. There was 15 women and 11 men who took part. And 77% of the participants were of a white ethnicity. And so just to give you a bit of background, the majority of qualitative research in this area is almost exclusively comprised of white females. So I, I, I do think that they made a real effort here to improve diversity in this study. Data was collected using semi-structured interviews with trial participants. Their interview schedule focused on key personal, social, environmental challenges to weight loss, as well as strategies used in managing lapses and relapse. The interviews were recorded and transcribed and analyzed using thematic analysis. This is a type of analysis that's used to identify repeated patterns of meaning or themes across a data set. It's a very intensive process. If you ever try and undertake this kind of analysis, you'll very quickly start to see how it would be impossible to do this with large numbers of people. You would be doing it for years and you would never be able to hold that amount of data in your head and synthesize it. So the key findings from this study were that people who had maintained weight 
five year, at five years after the intervention had a greater focus on dietary self-monitoring, but interestingly, not weight monitoring. So they, they tended to focus more on noticing changes in their appearance or clothing rather than actual numbers on the scale as a trigger for action to make further changes to their um, eating habits. And they also um, used, were good at anticipating and planning for potential lapses as well as social eating situations. Um, they found that people who had regained weight at five years placed less, fo less focus on dietary monitoring, um, undertook less planning and described more struggles with interpersonal relationships and food. So the strengths of this study, so first of all, the strengths. So there was a five-year follow-up time period after, after a weight management intervention. Um, the study was more demographically diverse than most qualitative studies in this area. There was good PPI or patient and public involvement input into the study. And the qualitative design allowed for in-depth accounts of participants' experiences. The limitations were that the strategies um, described were obviously self-reported and there's no way of knowing how well people actually used these strategies in practice. As I mentioned, the definitions of how they um, defined main weight maintainers and weight regainers, there was no justification for this and potentially other research teams doing a similar study might have chosen different limits for this. Also, the, the people who took part had received different intervention lengths. So some people were in the 12 week, had received the 12 week Weight Watchers intervention and some had received the 52 week. So they hadn't all received the exact same intervention. So what are the implications for clinical practice? So I wanted to start this discussion by focusing on, on this quote from the authors, which was in their discussion. It says healthcare providers should incorporate these strategies in future programs to equip participants with the skills to enact these strategies in the longer term and prevent weight regain. And the bit that I think that we really need to focus on is how we better support or equip patients with the skills to enact these strategies. There's a lot of qualitative data out there now, which highlights the key importance of social circumstances in how people navigate life and cope with changes after bariatric surgery. And when I did my own qualitative research in this area, I was really quite astounded at how much focus patients put on the social aspects um, in the interviews. Um, Yitka Graham as well, our BOMS research lead, has also published some nice qualitative research highlighting the importance of social issues after bariatric surgery. So there is actually a lot of data out there on this but people don't tend to look at the qualitative literature. So I, I think that we need to have um, a serious discussion about how we redesign weight management and bariatric services to incorporate this social support, because this really underpins the dietary and psychological support that we provide as integrated health professionals. We tend to focus on the individual, but if the individual's social circumstances make it difficult to put in place or maintain these strategies, then we need to be able to address this. And I don't think our services are, are set up to do this. So my question is, do we need to be working more closely with social care? Do we need to include social workers or occupational therapists on our multidisciplinary teams? Here in Bristol, our children's tier three weight management service has a social worker on the team and they have found them to be an absolutely critical part of the team. Um, should an adult service be doing this as well? Are there adult services that do include this? So I'm just going to leave it with those questions and I think we have a bit of time for a discussion now. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Well, that was um, really fantastic timing. Absolutely spot on, 12 minutes. So thank you, Karen. Really, really interesting presentation. And it, it, it's always hard to... Um, get get the grasp of qualitative uh, research really compared to what we're used to analyzing um the three kilogram uh weight regain limit that they used um no justification whatsoever for it so not but, that i could find but, in that uh, paper no uh -huh. yeah yeah that so that was one thing that was i mean 
and, and if someone, so if someone had, you know, a weight regain of 3.2 kilograms, for example, they would have been classed as a, as, as a weight regainer and someone who had gained 2.9 kilograms would have been classed as a, as a weight maintainer. So yeah, that was definitely a limitation, I think. And, but I'm not aware that there is any consensus of how we should define those two things anyhow. I think, uh, I think from my own looking at the literature, trying to find a consensus on what weight regain is, other than just not losing, other than the 50% excess weight loss figure that people claim, uh, you know, there's no consensus out there and that makes it harder when you're comparing papers and comparing interventions. I just, wonder, I just wonder, what, one more question from me and then we'll go to the um, uh, audience questions. What do you see as the key strategies uh, to support patients with weight maintenance or avoid weight regain. So if you were to have a wish list in your MDT, you've mentioned about social care and possibly mm -hmm. getting social workers in, uh, but what, what, from your experience, what would you like to see happen in MDTs? I would like a much longer than two year follow-up. Um, I would like long-term, uh, lifelong follow-up um, of specialist health professionals for people that have undergone bariatric surgery. Mm quite simple but um not that simple to implement of course i mean achieving that achieving that within already overstretched uh, nhs resources and clinics uh, is extremely difficult uh, maybe the move to virtual consultations and virtual follow-up to try to free up clinic mm -hmm. space is a way forward for the future uh, okay uh, i'll allow um i'll allow ahmed to take the next question uh, thank you sharif and karen again a really uh, great uh, great uh, presentation um, and just one thing I'd like to add is uh, a three kilogram weight regain in somebody who's 150 kilo at five years is probably not a big, a big deal. That's probably part of physiological weight gain anyway. But anyhow, uh, we've got a question here from Caroline Savage. Um, and she asks, uh, can you say more and, and give examples of what the authors mean by struggles with interpersonal relationships with food? Yeah, so let me just bring up the paper here. I think they had some some nice quotes on this. Um, I believe that it was around, um, so navigating difficult situations when, you know, unhealthy foods were available and put in front of them and how they, how they negotiated you know, that kind of pressure to eat those kinds of foods, as well as balancing, um, you know, difficult or challenging family dynamics and, you know, their role within the family and, and, and what they need to do, balancing parenthood and, and, and everything. So it, there was a range of things and certainly the qualitative, other qualitative literature in this area, it, 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 it spans quite a few different things. Um, so managing social, occasions with with co-workers and friends but also managing um difficulties from perhaps partners who aren't as supportive of weight loss or as supportive of making those changes as well as managing the demands of having a family i hope i've answered that adequately mm, definitely um karen we've got one more question here there's one from max major saying i was interested to see that many maintainers did not use regular self-weighing and physical activity mm -hmm. as maintenance strategies which have been found to be effective strategies in other studies um, we're interested to hear your thoughts on why they may not have favored or implemented these yes yeah, so there's one thing that they found one of the themes was around um dietary flexibility um and yeah flexibility in dietary behaviors and so it 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 may be that that people were were trying to take a a, a more balanced approach to this and and not you know get too hung up on on particular things like weight um they they did find that there was variability in that so there was no there were some people who did and some who didn't but there was no kind of strong um difference between maintainers and regainers on that and I, and I think that's really interesting um, because certainly there are, there are people who find regular weighing quite um, that brings on a lot of anxiety for them and they find it actually really unhelpful and and, and makes them more obsessed so I, I, I thought that that was actually quite encouraging to read that that 
the people in this group, they did manage to maintain weight and they weren't necessarily obsessively weighing themselves. They were focusing on other things like their appearance, um, how their clothes fit. And, and there was this theme around flexibility, which I thought that was quite encouraging. Again, this was, this was a different, slightly different population to who we would be seeing in bariatric surgery. These were, these were people who had attended a, a, a primary care weight management intervention. So whether that would be the case with bariatric patients, I don't know. Karen, I'm just going to ask you the last question, uh, which comes from Emma uh, Shuttlewood. Uh, so she's asking, uh, first of all, thanking you for your presentation and bringing um, uh, qualitative research to the Journal Club tonight. Uh, and the second, uh, was there any theme that arose around psychological well-being and how that interacted with the strategies and weight management? Did you pick up any themes? Right. So there wasn't anything particularly in this paper on that, um, other than managing interpersonal relationships. Um, but there is certainly a wealth of literature on um, psychological changes after bariatric surgery in the qualitative literature. And it's, it's not very clear cut at all. Um, with some things improving, some things not improving. So it's, it's a really um, complex, messy story with um, psychological changes and bariatric surgery, but I'd be really happy to pass some literature on or discuss that with you when we have a bit more time at another time. Karen, thank you very much. Um, you introduced quality research to us. I think it's another methodology, if you like, to answer a lot of scientific questions. I have definitely found it very useful. One of the risks of using papers in journal clubs that are UK-based, and I, I say risk with um, uh, tongue-in-cheek, is that sometimes the authors are in the audience, and um, Carla Hughes has already very kindly answered some of the comments regarding the three kilos. Um, <laughs> Chosen because that Brilliant. was a clinician. I'd like to hear. <laughs> <laughs> it was clinicians. Um, it was discussion with clinicians, and it was a fair comment. So, fair enough. So, thank you, Karen. And I will now move to Alexis Sadlow. Alexis is our research fellow here in North Bristol. She's doing a PhD in collaboration with the University College Dublin, and is funded by the Royal College of Surgeons Research Fellowship Scheme. Alexis, the floor is yours. All right. Lovely. Um, hopefully, everybody can see my slides. Yes, excellent. Okay. Um, so the paper that we've oh, hold on. Let's go. So the paper that we've chosen to discuss this evening is the 10-year follow-up data from a randomized control trial, which is comparing metabolic surgery. So in this trial, um, Ruan Y gastric bypass or biliopancreatic diversion compared to medical therapy in patients with type 2 diabetes and obesity. <clears throat> it was published in the Lancet uh, in January. And if you look at the author list, you'll probably recognize some of the authors. So we have Professor Mingroni and Professor Rubino, both of whom work in the UK. And this is actually coming out of one of the world's most uh, widely recognized bariatric surgery units um, from Italy. So just to start with a bit of background, what do we already know about bariatric surgery and type 2 diabetes? Well, we have 12 randomized controlled trials now um, showing that irrespective of the procedure performed, that bariatric surgery um, is a superior treatment to medical therapy for patients with obesity and type 2 diabetes. Um, and as such, it's been recognized by both the American Diabetes Association and the International Diabetes Federation as standard treatments in their treatment algorithm for patients suffering from both diseases. Um, going along with the clinical data that we have, we also have mechanistic studies which show that there are um, neurohormonal changes which occur within days of surgery that result in a rapid normalization of glycemia, um, and it allows most patients by and large to stop their medications uh, even before they've even left hospital, and that's become kind of the standard is that medications are stopped following surgery. Unfortunately, the clinical data that we do have so far is limited to medium to short-term follow-up. That's from randomized controlled trials. And we don't really have much going beyond five years. Um, just a point worth noting, when we look at any studies looking at bariatric surgery as a treatment for type two diabetes, it's important that we're mindful that there's quite a lot of variability in the rates of diabetes remission that are reported. Um, and that's few factors, but one of them being the definition of diabetes remission, which is used. 
And if you look at any number of papers, you can see that a lot of them use similar, but their own definition of diabetes remission. And if you retrospectively apply the strict ADA criteria for diabetes remission, you find in a lot of cases that the reported diabetes remission rates actually fall. Uh, the reported rates are also dependent on the length of follow-up of the studies, as we do know that the metabolic effects of bariatric surgery tend to diminish with time and a proportion of patients um, down the line will experience a relapse of their uh, diabetes. Uh, and just to give people kind of a rough figure as to what we expect following bariatric surgery, um, data from a randomized control trial, or sorry, from a trial has uh, suggested that approximately one in four patients will re maintain remission at five years. So the paper that we've chosen this evening is a 10 year follow up data, um, but they've previously published two and five year data from the same trial. Um, and you'll see the five year data here on the screen. Um, and just to illustrate the points that I was mentioning before, if you look at the rural Y gastric bypass group, which is one of the most commonly performed procedures for patients with diabetes, you'll see that at two years, the reported remission rate is 75%. But in keeping with what I said about the remission rates falling with time, you can see that at five years, that's dropped to 37%. Now, taking into account the other point I mentioned about the importance of using a standardized definition, if they use the partial remission definition at five years, they have 37% of patients in remission. But then applying the more strict complete remission criteria in this exact same group, these patients, the remission rate drops to zero. So you can see the importance of that effect. So going on to the actual paper that we're discussing this evening, as I said, it's a 10 year follow-up data from an open label randomized control trial where patients were allocated one to one to one to either medical therapy, rural Y gastric bypass or BPD. <clears throat> and the inclusion criteria they used is pretty standard for most bariatric surgery trials involving diabetes, but they have stipulated that the patients have to have a duration of diabetes greater than five years, which isn't necessarily something you would always see. I've also included that they've used um, the ADA partial remission definition. So that's an HbA1c of less than 6.5 off all medications for one year, which is fine. It's just not the complete remission definition that other papers may have used. They also have a number of clinically relevant secondary outcomes, and I'll discuss a couple of them later on. <clears throat> So just to go to the primary outcome, uh, which is the 10-year diabetes remission rate, you'll see that with time in both the surgical groups, the diabetes remission rate falls. So at 10 years in the Rouen Y group, only 25% of patients are still in remission. Uh, and that is 50% in the BPD group. But what's important to keep in mind is that irrespective of the fact that some of these patients are having a relapse of their diabetes, it's critical to note that the glycemic control is very good, irrespective. So you'll see there's a 7% treatment threshold for an HbA1c level. And 87% of the patients in the surgically treated groups have meet, uh, reached that treatment threshold, whereas none of the patients in the medical group uh, met that target. Going on to weight loss, it's also important to note that these patients are experiencing a relapse of their diabetes in the absence of any significant weight gain. So you'll see that in both the surgical groups, as expected, they lose a large amount of weight in the first year following their operation. But this weight loss is maintained over the entire 10 year duration follow up. <clears throat> uh, moving on to medication use, again, this reflects the fact that patients over time are experiencing a relapse of their diabetes. So you'll see the Rouen Y group is the columns in the middle and BPD on the right. Uh, both groups at two years, 100% of the patients are off medications, which would suggest that by and large, the majority are in remission. As you move further towards the right, you'll see that an increasing proportion of patients are on medications. As you can see, there's more colors in each of the bar graphs. Um, at 10 years, only 25% of the rural Y patients are off medications and 60% of patients in the BPD group. So there's an increasing number of patients in both groups who are needing medication to maintain normal glycemia. So overall, there's a 10-year remission rate of 37% in the surgical group compared to 5.5% in the medical group. And it's important to note that that 5.5% actually reflects the fact that it's an intention to treat analysis. Um, and those patients were patients who were allocated to the medical group and then crossed over to the surgical group. 
Um, it highlights the fact that unfortunately diabetes remission following bariatric surgery isn't necessarily durable. 58.8% um, of the patients who were in remission in this study at two years were no longer in remission at 10 years. But it's important to note that the glycemic control in both surgical groups was very good throughout the whole duration of the 10-year follow-up period. So in terms of study strengths, this is the longest data that we, or longest follow-up data that we have from any randomized controlled trial available. Um, they were able to follow up 95% of their patients and reflecting real world practice, the medical therapy group that they had included some of the more novel agents that we're using, including SGLT2 inhibitors and GLP-1 analogs. So we are comparing up-to-date medical therapy to bariatric surgery. In terms of the limitation, um, there's a risk of bias as blinding is not possible. Obviously, we're comparing surgery and medications, but even between the two surgical groups, they couldn't blind the patients or the assessors because BPD was done as an open procedure, whereas the bypasses were done laparoscopically. Um, there's fairly small sample size. Each group was 20 patients in each arm. Um, and as such, it's important to note that the study is not power to detect differences between surgical procedures. So based on this data, we can't come away and say that BPD or Renal Y is better for the treatment of diabetes. So what are the clinical implications of this study? Um, the findings are not surprising and it's in keeping with what we've already seen from all the other previously randomized controlled trials. We just now have uh, longer follow-up. So we now have 10 years of follow-up confirming what we've already seen. And that basically shows us that bariatric surgery is an effective means of inducing diabetes remission. But we should expect that a proportion of patients over time will experience a relapse of their diabetes. But glycemic control in patients treated surgically does remain good. So although this isn't something unexpected, perhaps this is a time for us to reflect and stop and think what we're trying to achieve. Um, at present, what we're trying to do is use surgery to treat a chronic progressive multi-system disease without offering any further treatment. So rather than seeing bariatric surgery as a standalone treatment for diabetes, perhaps it's time to re-envision it as part of a treatment algorithm in which we use surgery to induce remission, but then we need to offer further treatment to sustain this in the long term. Uh, and this approach has already been investigated in other randomized controlled trials, for example. Uh, the Gravitas study um, looked into the use of liraglutide in patients who had undergone uh, bariatric surgery and either had a relapse of their diabetes or had ongoing diabetes after their um, surgery. And not only did they show that you can safely combine pharmacotherapy and bariatric surgery, but you can produce clinically important um, improvements in glycemic control and further weight loss as well in these patients. So our current approach um, of offering just standalone bariatric surgery to treat diabetes um, is really unfortunately clearly inadequate because we have such a high rate of relapse. But what we need to do is to develop evidence-based approaches to finding long-term treatment strategies which include the use of pharmacotherapy in conjunction with bariatric surgery to improve long-term glycemic control. It also raises the other important question that if we look at what we consider to be one of the most effective treatments for type 2 diabetes that's used in this country, it's Ruan Y gastric bypass. And it shows this study data showed us that 75% of patients will experience a relapse by 10 years. So you could almost say it's an inevitability for a lot of patients that they will relapse. So should we be waiting for something that we can almost expect will happen and then initiate treatment or should we be initiating treatment early on or even carrying it on in the immediate post-operative period for these patients to help improve their long-term outcomes? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alexis. That was a fantastic presentation and I'm really delighted to see another fellow trainee stepping up to the plate and delivering a presentation this month again. So thank you for doing that. Um, really amazing paper and it was one of the obviously one of the key papers to come out this year and be a landmark paper in bariatric surgery um, I just wanted to ask because obviously everything is tailored towards the suggestion that relapse is detrimental relapse is bad and that you know obviously this is happening even within a 10 year time frame after surgery have the authors commented on the improvement within the lifetime of the patient that even with a short five to seven to 10 year episode of 
improved HbA1c and diabetic control, despite the relapse, that that has actually given years of extra life and years of extra health. Because you mentioned that they noted that glycemic control was still good despite mm -hmm. these rises in the HbA1c. So have they managed to quantify it overall? Off the top of my head, I don't think they've specifically said I mean, they've obviously noted the glycemic control remains good. And I don't think that they specifically addressed what the knock-on effect of that is. But I think we've seen from other studies, the UK PDS study shows the legacy effect of even a short-term improvement in glycemic control. Um, so I think we already have good data to suggest that if we can improve patients' glycemic control, even for a short period, ideally for a long period, that we can improve the, the long-term outcomes for these patients. Uh, great, thanks uh, very much. Very nicely presented. So we have some questions from the audience. I think one is from uh, your own hospital. We've got Jim Hughes uh, asking about, uh, does the study give any explanation for the weight independent deterioration in glycemic control over the 10 years? No, I don't think that they address that specifically as far as I can recall. Um, I think I suppose some of it, the patients had quite a long duration of diabetes in this study compared to others. So perhaps they already have some beta cell loss because it was already, they had to have a duration of diabetes greater than five years. So perhaps that would have had some implications for why they're having the relapse of symptoms independent of any re weight regain. Perfect, thank you. Uh, any implications, um, uh, Alexis, from sort of the findings of this study and how we counsel patients and also importantly we discharge patients at two years mm. and this is looking at what happens five ten years down the line and who's going to pick up them often gps may not be doing hba1c's once we tell them that patients are in remission now so what would your advice be to colleagues and mdts well, I think that's part of the problem is that we don't really have any kind of long-term treatment algorithms for something that we now know is almost an inevitability for a lot of these patients. And that's what we need to do is develop some pathways for maintaining, you know, ongoing monitoring of these patients. We can't just stop their medications, dust off our hands and say job done. When we now have data that shows that actually there is more to be done. Patients do need ongoing medications and we do need to continue monitoring their glycemic control if we want to have better outcomes than we are getting now. And I think also from what you said, from the patient perspective, it's important to explain to them, a patient's put a huge amount of importance on this idea of getting a cure or remission of their diabetes. And a lot of patients take on a personal feeling of responsibility for that. So I think it's important to maintain the um, dialogue and let them know that some of it, or a lot of it comes down to physiology that's beyond their control. So we've had a few uh, supportive comments from other um, members in the audience, mainly about the consent process and importance for follow-up guidance. Uh, and also it'll be good to see data from the direct trial, uh, which will measure surgical outcomes. Any role you can see for um, some of the new medications which have hit the market? Yeah, I mean, definitely. I think the Gravitas study kind of established that you can combine medication and bariatric surgery safely. It's a GLP-1 analog, so it's one of the more novel ones. Um, but I think at this point, what we need to do is just establish any any type of medication really in the post-operative period would be probably beneficial. But certainly, um, Gravitas suggested that you could in, um, induce clinically significant improvements in glycemic control in these patients. Okay. Who do you think is best placed to follow up patients post-op? So after the surgeon has done the bypass BPD sleeve, should it be a surgical lead service or should we be involving our physician colleagues a little bit more in the follow-up? I think definitely it should be a joint effort. I think the endocrinologist would have a lot. Uh, they've got a lot of experience in using medications. I mean, Diabetes control is all about com combining medications. There are very few patients who are maintained on monotherapy anyway. So I think an endocrinologist probably with bariatric specialist interest would be best suited to work in conjunction with the patients. Alexis, we've got a question about the mechanistic aspects of it. Um, and Vinod Menon is asking, was the realm Y gastric bypass uh, standardized in terms of limb lengths in the study throughout the duration? And did this have an effect? I 
believe it was. I can't answer. It wasn't common because this is the 10 year follow up data. So they hadn't specifically mentioned it in this paper. They've always kind of alluded to it being previously discussed. So I can't say for sure, to be honest. I don't know if anybody else has read it in far greater detail. Okay. Thank you very much. I think, do we want to hand back to Dimitri Ponaras now in terms of um, to close? Thank you. Um, thank you, Roxana. Thank you, um, um, Alexis. And I think that uh, this is a great paper. It, it, it's true. It's a landmark paper. It will change our practice. But the first thing it does, it, it highlights the fact that we need to start thinking about what sort of pathways we have, as Sarif said, uh, what sort of medication combinations we do, as, uh, as we discussed earlier on. So we need to start working in, the, in that field. Um, I was just going to thank everyone for uh, being with us at this uh, very late hour. Um, and I'll just also say that as part of BOMS um, and in collaboration with the Royal College of Surgeons, um, there will be some more uh, research that will be collaborative. We are developing a strategy for the next five years and it will be from the membership, it will be, it will be bottom up. Um, we will be reaching out. There will be some emails coming out to most of you. And I know that um, a lot of the audience are um, BOMS membership, but I know they're also um, audience from all over the world and uh, of course we will be reaching out to you as well so we can design the future studies uh, and the papers we'll be discussing in these journal clubs in the years to come. Thank you very much and uh, I'm going to hand uh, back to Sari for, uh, for a good night. Good night everyone for me. No, thank you very much. And once again, just to thank uh, all the attendees and thank the Bristol team for a fantastic journal club again. Um, you have surpassed uh, and we keep on getting better and better. Just two dates for your diaries again, uh, 24th, the last Wednesday of the month, uh, 24th of March, uh, we're going to be doing our second educational webinar with Dr. Scott Shikora. And then the second Wednesday of April, uh, the 14th of April will be the journal club by uh, UCL. The team will be running that. And if there's any attendees who are not uh, signed up to the mailing list, please email info at bombs.org and ask to have your email address onto the mailing list so we can keep in contact with you because uh, BOMS is very, very busy in the background with all of these educational events uh, and trying to engage more with membership and it's working great. Um, and finally, the session tonight has been recorded. So if you have colleagues who haven't been able to watch, uh, we'll be sending out an email hopefully Friday with the links to the YouTube recordings of all the educational events that BOMS have uh, put on so far. Thank you very much and good night.